I remember when I took statistics. Um, it's a bit tricky to understand statistics, but depending on what formula a person uses to apply the statistics, then it may make sense. And there are certain rules that one uses to kind of say, well, there's a 30% chance of this and a 70% chance of that. Then when studying epidemiology, you say, well, when I observe that this happens, most of the time this occurs or that occurs. And, and so, um, for example, for the 5K race tomorrow, there's a 10% chance of rain at 7 a.m. And then there's uh, a, I think it was a 14% chance by like 9 a.m. But then there's a 54% chance at 10 a.m. And there's a 80% chance that we'll probably be there still at 10 a.m. And that probably it's going to be raining by 11, but I don't know. You know, if there was a 1% chance that it was going to rain tomorrow and then it rained, you know, well, it didn't do us any good. Which leads me to our, you know, to my most frustrating class, which was uh, uh, population statistics. And so population statistics was, you know, um, you run a healthcare clinic and... Um, a part of New York City. And you're given um, by a government agency, a city agency or state agency, $80,000 to take care of people who need, um, who have, um, you know, hepatitis. And that's what you get. You're like, okay, well, how many people have it? Well, we don't know. And you say, okay, well, how many people do you think have it? And you're like, well, maybe this many. Well, do we have a treatment for it? Well, some are good, some work, some don't. So a person going through a brain tumor and the treatment is going to get statistics. And, and, and I'm very uh, keen to observe that we have to be careful as clinicians not to be over-exuberant about an early promising study because if we oversell something that's hope, um, then we don't have the statistics to back it. At the same time, if it's a 10% chance that it'll rain and it rains, well then maybe that 10% chance that this works or 20% chance that it works, it was worth it. Um, I, I think that ultimately it's a very frustrating um, exercise when a person who's a control freak, like myself, um, goes and says, well, what are my options? I'm going to do this like I do everything else in life. Um, and, and I'm going to line them up. I'm going to think it through. I'm going to learn about them. And then I'm going to... If I weren't a neuro-oncologist, I would question the, you know, my own ability to cram 15 years of neuro-oncology subspecialty expertise and have a judgment that would be worth my decision making without asking another person for an opinion. I mean, I should inform myself. Then that comes to trust, you know. It comes to trust and faith and confidence that you're triangulating all of your resources and they're pointing you in a somewhat similar direction. They don't have to be the same. I mean, a person can go for a second opinion and get like, like, if you ask two neuro-oncologists for opinion, you'll probably get three opinions, you know. One person will give you two, the other person will give you one. And they may or may not be the same, or they may say, yeah, that's good too, you know. 
that's really disquieting when somebody says that, I think. It's like, yeah, you could do that, you could do that. You know, that goes back to the menu. So in order to feel more secure, I believe, there has to be the recipe of an open dialogue and discourse with someone you trust who's a professional who knows his or her stuff. A knowledge that that person has your interests in mind and and that that clinician, that specialist, has no qualms about working with others and and explaining other things you may have read and even referring you to a study that may make more sense. Or to go through a list of seven studies that you've brought to the office and say, oh, well, I'll tell you why this one doesn't make sense for you because of this, but these look interesting. Let me call them and find out where they are. I think that that helps and, uh, you know, kind of a, a, a person's own coping with it and confidence that they're making the right decisions through this real, uh, uh, again, matrix decision-making process. Having said that, you know, if there were a right answer, then we would just give the right answer. If it was otitis media and a person didn't have an allergy to penicillin, I'd give them amoxicillin or penicillin and, and cure their ear infection. It's not a conspiracy, you know, that people aren't uh, wanting uh, a therapy to work. Uh, but the converse of that is that there's not necessarily a wrong answer many times at some juncture. And that's what's difficult, I think, intellectually spiritually to accept because that goes to uh, again using the word acceptance that well maybe I'm painted into a corner and I don't know that we necessarily should ever feel that way even if you know even if a decision is made to say well no I, I don't want to do that that's still a decision and that's still free will um, but so long as it's made in an informed way I think that uh, that can be empowering too. And it's an option that should always be um, uh, free to be discussed um, and according to where the, a person is. So for example, um, you know, sometimes people are in a place in their life where, you know, they don't really want to be very aggressive. You know, this is... This is something where um, no, I'm, I'm okay. You know, I, I, I'm doing this for my kids and my grandkids, but I, I'm not really wanting to be. Um, I, I'm, I've got, I'm, I'm in a good place. I don't want to do things that I don't want to do. And um, that happens from time to time. There are other times where uh, people are, um, you know, many times younger and in the middle of a, an absolutely, you know, brilliant place in their life and then it's, it's completely devastating. And a person says, whatever this is, this 1%, this... 10%, this 33%, I want to do it. Sometimes you have to rein them in, you know, and say, no, yeah, I know that bleach can, you know, destroy tumor cells, but please do not inject the bleach into your carotid artery. Please, don't do that. No, don't do it. I'm serious. And then uh, we go back and you say, all right, well, let's talk about reasonable things. And I mean, the people don't want reasonable, you know. What are you talking about reasonable? Let's be reasonable. We're not in a reasonable situation. Yeah. Okay, let's not be reasonable. Let's talk about strange things, you know. And, and if that's what we need to talk about, and we need to do something outlandish or something really edgy, well, we'll find it and we'll do it if it's appropriate. You know, I, I don't want to, um, you know, I don't ever want to get in the way of somebody wanting to ask about something. But I will say when I think it's not in their best interest. 
um, because it's kind of like saying, you know, uh, you know, not so stopping somebody from doing something bad. It's, you know, sin of omission versus sin of commission, you know. Um, but at the same time, uh, I have to say that despite all of these conversations, almost every visit, you know, there's laughter in the room, which is like, I still bizarre to me, you know. Uh, not always, but many times there is, because what are you going to do? You know, my mom, uh, I remember when she lost her sister to colon cancer, you know. She's fairly stoic, you know. Uh, she, my dad is not. Uh, he's the opposite of that. And, uh, but I was like thinking to myself, you know, maybe she didn't say much, you know. So I asked her, I said, you know, Mama, are you, uh, are you okay with, um, you know, Thea Kiki and, you know, Thea Wawa? So, she looked at me like, do you, do you want me to cry for you or, you know, what? And so I, I thought about that and I go, yeah, okay, that's your processing set, you know. It's always been her processing set. Uh, it's always been her advice to me to actually, why don't you just keep things in? Uh, it's been, uh, actually, I, I think about that now, you know. My, um, uh, you know, my dad would, uh, you know, Greek immigrant, would uh, tell me in Greek, you know, get me the screwdriver, he'd yell it in Greek, you know, come over here. And, uh, um I'm like, which one? Is it the one that goes like this, or is it the one with the line? He'd be like, go help your mother. And so then I go to my uh, mom, who's like infinitely patient, smooth, calm, never a crossword out of her mouth, ever. So, I mean, she would help me, you know, say, well, here's how you make, you know, baklava. Here's how you make this dessert. Well, this is how I like to make that. So then I'm like, I, I, I think back, I go, you know, no wonder I'm not a surgeon. You know, I'm all about the recipes, you know. And, and so she has always been like the super calm one, you know. But it doesn't mean that she's not processing these things. She used to tell me, Nick, you know, when you've got something, when you've got something that's really bothering you, she says, you should really repress that. Keep it down deep until it really pains you. And then, so then you can digest it, and then you'll know what it feels like. Because otherwise, you know, what are you going to do? Complain about it. And um, it turns out my medical classes gave me, you know, very contradictory advice to this. I'm like, maybe we should talk about it. Um, but it works for my mom. Uh, and there are some people who can uh, express themselves and others who can't. And that comes out in the clinic. And there are some people who know how to ask for help, who want to talk about things. And there are some people where you have to kind of find out how to connect uh, and talk about these treatment options that they have um, and what their goals are and what their desires are um, and try to work it into something sensible for them. 